If you heard this gospel probably outside of church, outside of mass, you probably would have wondered, is this really Jesus? Is this from one of the four gospels in the gospel, in the Bible? You probably go home and check it to make sure what you heard or what someone told you is really what Jesus said. Because it's not the way we're used to hearing Jesus talk to us. I've come to set the earth on fire. I did not come to establish peace, but rather division. I have a baptism to undergo, although these words are said by Jesus after he was baptized by John the Baptist. What baptism? What division? What peace? What does he mean? Isn't he the Prince of Peace? Isn't that what the angels declared at his birth? Peace to, uh, to all people of goodwill? Why is Jesus talking like this? Let us go through what these things mean, because obviously they don't mean what we're thinking. Jesus don't want to set the world on fire like the fires we have in California in the western states. But let's start with the last section where Jesus talks about division, but he specifically mentions family relationships. He doesn't talk about divis divisions in politics or in the economy or in the religion. He mentions a father turning against his son, a son against his father, a daughter against her mother, and so on and so forth. Well, in the, gospel, in the uh, Jewish people's understanding of their faith, the most important thing for them was their family ties because they were tribal people and tribes were made of families unless those families take together, stay together, then the tribe will be weakened. Nothing more important than family relationships and connections except one thing, your relationship with God. God came first before family. And that Jesus specifically mentions those examples is in a way telling them I am God because I'm more important than your family ties. So part of this gospel is really to reveal the identity of Jesus, as Jesus does in the gospels in different ways. That's the only reason why the head of a household would allow division in his family if it's taking them away from God. By why Jesus didn't come to establish peace? Did he really come to establish divisions? Jesus came to bring us peace. And the way of peace Jesus that brought to us is by telling us the truth, by revealing to us God's love for us, by revealing to us that we are all sinners and we need a Savior, and he's that one Savior who came to take on upon himself all the sins of the world so one day we can share in his divinity in heaven. But that's the part that Jesus did. There's a part on behalf of the hearers. Do we accept the truth that he told us? Do we accept his words? Do we follow him on the path that he showed us, the path of love? Obviously, some people do, some people don't. And that's what caused those divisions. Because again, those who heard the words of Jesus and believed them, they were willing to leave behind family ties, families, spouses, brothers and sisters, parents, children, to follow Jesus. Division is nothing new in the church or in the world, as you know. There were divisions from the beginning of time, from the time of Jesus. There's still divisions today. And how do we deal with divisions? Well, you know, we're getting close to Thanksgiving and Christmas. Family's going to get together. And I hear a lot of people saying, when we get together as a family, two things we don't talk about. What are they? Politics and religion. Is that the way of Jesus? We think by not talking about them, we have peace. But really, it's a false peace. It's not the true peace. And that's where our first reading from the prophet Jeremiah comes in as foreshadowing what Jesus will do later on. 
Jeremiah spoke the truth to his people. He told them what God told them to tell them. They are about to enter a war with one of the superpowers of their time, the Babylonians. And they were thinking, should we fight them? Should we make allegiance, you know, alliances with Egypt, the other superpower? And Jeremiah told them, no, God wants you to surrender to them. Now, you can imagine that wasn't a popular message. The people didn't want to hear this. The nobles did not want to hear this. So they conspired on Jeremiah. They pressured the king to throw him into the well, the dry well, to die. But Jeremiah did not change this message. He stuck to the truth. And God brought him salvation through a pagan who talked to the king, and the king brought him out of the well. Same with Jesus. The religious authorities, the people of his time, they did not like his message. All he had to say, well, no, I'm not the son of God. But he stuck to the truth. He told Pilate, I came for the truth. I came so the world would know the way to salvation. The same thing. People did not like his message, and they crucified him. And God came to his rescue and raised him up. By not talking the truth, how can we become united again? By ignoring an issue, it doesn't go away. I mean, we know all of this from just relationships, whether you have issues with your spouse, with your parents, with the coworker. By keeping it inside, you know what's going to happen. One day, it's going to explode and come out in a negative way. We need to address these things. And if we can't address them with our own family members, how are we going to address them as a nation, as a church, as a society, as a world? By ignoring the truth, it doesn't solve anything. It misleads everyone and puts us in that sense of false truth, false peace, that we know one day will come crumbling down on us and all of those involved. We need to find ways how we can speak the truth with love, with the charity, without judgment, without condemning the other. Our solution, while well, everybody has their own truth, that's not a solution. That's avoiding the problem. At least as Catholics, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we believe he is the truth, not a truth, but the truth, the way, the life. That's what Jesus talks about when he says, I want to set the world on fire. Because brothers and sisters, we have become lukewarm. We have become complacent. We're just comfortable in our own lives and the way we do things, avoiding issues. But look where it's leading our world. Do you see it moving towards unity? It's not. We're getting more and more and more divided. Being on fire means being passionate about Jesus, about our faith, about the truth. It means about having something to contribute to the world and show them how although we might have our differences, but we can also look at our, what unites us and work on that so it will increase. We can show them that differences doesn't necessarily mean lead us to being enemies of one another, disrespectful for, of one another, but that we can sit down together and talk about these differences and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us to the true truth. But unless we talk about it, it's not going to happen we'll get more and more separated from one another, more and more believing in our own way and not listening to others. The baptism that Jesus is talking about is his death and resurrection on the cross. It's paying the price for the truth that he came to proclaim. You know, in the second reading, the author of the letter tells the people, you haven't yet suffered enough to avoid sin for the shedding of, the, of your blood. 
Being a disciple of Jesus Christ means sacrifice, means commitment, means having a certain set of beliefs, what Jesus handed on to us, so we can continue and move forward in the world and proclaim the good news of salvation. Being like everyone else doesn't make a difference in the world. I mean, look, all of us love heroes, even fictional heroes. Superman, Superwoman, Bad Girl, Batman, all of the Marvel, you know, heroes in the world. Why do we like them? They weren't like anyone else. They were willing to step up and take a stand and fight for the common good, fight for what they believe to be the truth. Why won't we do this for Jesus if we believe he is the truth, the way, and the life? Being complacent is not going to revive the church. No one program, no one thing we do. We have to be transformed. We have to set our hearts on fire for the love of the Lord. That's the fire that Jesus is talking about, the fire of love, the passion, the determination that let thousands and thousands of Christians give their life for the faith, that let people throughout the centuries to leave home, to leave out their belongings, to give everything up, to follow Christ, to travel to distant lands, to proclaim the good news. We need heroes today. That's what Jesus is looking for. That's the fire he's talking about, the fire that will transform us from being like everybody else, comfortable in our lives, and willing to put everything on the line for Christ, to stand out, not to blend in like everyone else. That's the way of Christ. That's the way that will lead us to salvation. Maybe today it takes a few minutes and read that gospel again. See what it says to you. What it's calling you to do in your own life. What relationships you have to work on to men. Not using the ways of the world, but using the truth in love. Sharing it with others. And maybe you can ask yourself, how much are you willing to put on the line for Jesus? I don't think we are all ready to shed our blood yet, but what's the next step? What are you letting go of? What are you giving up for the sake of Christ, for the sake of truth, for the sake of a passionate love, a love that unites us not just with Christ and God, but with one another? because we'll all be following that same truth, the truth of Jesus.